Assalamu alaikum khawateen wa asraat. Basim Aysen welcomes you to lecture number 17 of Marketing for Non-Profits MKT 628 at the Virtual University of Pakistan. The topic of learning is mood boards. A mood boards they basically are considered to be a part of the visual identity, but I did not choose to talk about this particular aspect as part of the visual identity when I talked about elements like logos, typography, colors and imagery of different kinds like uh, the photographs and graphics and so on and so forth. The reason I'm talking about mood boards as uh, a separate component uh, is that the prerequisite to understand this is an appreciation of uh, the other elements which are just enumerated. The ones that uh, compose the visual identity. So in other words, understanding of those lays the ground for being able to prepare a mood board. A mood board basically is a collage or a combination of the different pictorials, photographs or images or graphics, typography, or different colors which are illustrative of different features of the organization. So in other words, um, but we can say that uh, all those attributes of the organization which can be expressed as adjectives are the ones which are translated into images when we prepare a mood board. The reason uh, that we prepared the mood board is because we want everybody within the organization to be on the same page, not only on the same page, but also on the same line. They get on to the same line by looking at something which is consistent, which everybody can see with the naked eye. Um, and the reason I say here is because everybody has a way of perceiving attributes or features that we are known for. If we are known for our hard work or our passion or our efficiency, all those things can be illustrated into graphics or images. And that's what a mood board does. Being a collection of uh, the different images and photographs we translate all those adjectives and uh, to put those together um, in a way that um, they reflect the overall personality of the organization. And the basic objective here is to project the personality in a way which is looked upon everybody in a consistent manner. There should be no inconsistency in viewing all those attributes with which the organization carries or which the organization is endowed with. So in other words, a mood board basically is kind of a visual roadmap for the identity of the organization, which of course reflects the organizational level. The reason that we create these is because uh, we do not want the people meaning part of the internal audience of the organization and also those stakeholders who are actively supporting the cause because their support matters a lot toward execution of programs and generation of funds. And therefore, none of them can say that they would like to bring about certain changes in the visual identity of the organization because they do not prefer certain colors, they do not prefer certain attributes the way that they have been uh, uh, translated into images that when we put together our formal communications and later on that when we get into advertising, uh, that may that be print advertising or advertising on the web or uh, television on air, that we use these uh, the mood boards because we have a ready-made 
base of uh, how the personality of the organization looks like. Let me give you an example of uh, the cancer hospital, Shokathanum, the way they might have prepared their mood board when they started off. I'm saying might have. I'm not saying they did the way I'm going to talk about it. They, they might have taken different attributes into consideration while uh, putting different images together, like uh, portraying uh, the pain of the sufferers. And uh, also, at the same time, the portraying uh, the image uh, of uh, the passion with which uh, people in the hospital would like to alleviate that suffering. And also, imagery of uh, hope and uh, the efficiency uh, related with um, the state-of-the-art equipment and uh, the presence of uh, the highly qualified uh, the doctors and other uh, technical staff and so on and so forth. These are the kind of images with which they might have put together in order to let everybody within the hospital and the organization know this is the way they would like to get the build up the personality of the hospital because they believe in these attributes and this is what they are going to work on as a program. And they do have the capability and core competencies to take the program forward, uh, develop a positioning which will reflect the personality shown as part of the mood board. So in other words, we can say that we really can um, pinpoint and crystallize the, the way um, the theme of uh, the communication uh, will reflect the personality. And uh, the mood boards, therefore, happen to be an important uh, the element which connects the, the visual identity with the uh, messaging uh, platform. And it also lays the ground uh, for uh, any upcoming communications in future. Uh, the one uh, the word I would like to add here is that uh, you they may have to bring about changes, or rather you will have to bring about changes uh, from time to time because whenever you think uh, the external environment has changed and has brought about a corresponding change within the internal environment also. If you think that has had a bearing on the personality of the organization or it has uh, repositioned the organization, then of course, you will have to bring about a change in the mood board, otherwise it remains the same. And it provides a good basis, an effective basis for very consistent communication. Let us now get uh, into the next component of learning, which is the messaging platform as uh, part of the identity level of uh, the brand raising. Do not lose sight of the fact that uh, we still are into the identity level, which started with the visual identity consisting of um, logo, colors, typography, images, etc. And uh, then it went on to the mood boards, uh, which of course I talked as uh, the kind of a link between the visual identity and what I'm gonna talk now. Keeping our emphasis on the elements that I'm gonna talk about, let's start with the name of the organization. What is so significant about the name? Well, there are two schools of thought. The one is that uh, there is not much in the name because a brand basically reflects a very comprehensive strategic process. And out of that uh, strategic process, uh, the process for brand raising emerges. And as a matter of fact, you know, both are quite interrelated and intertwined. And uh, if we follow all the steps logically and uh, let them flow uh, in a continual fashion that we end up with a positioning for the organization which defines the point of differentiation. And that point of differentiation basically is the reflection of our resources and capabilities and core competencies and so on and so forth. And based on that, we have the personality of the organization which is something that along with positioning that has to be communicated to all the audiences that we interact with. These audiences are internal audiences and they are external audiences in um, the shape of uh, the activists and volunteers and uh, the other stakeholders like community leaders, uh, the funders and donors, government agencies, um, and even media and legislators. So communicating with uh, all these audiences uh, 
really uh, get to make uh, get to it extremely uh, get to important uh, that uh, get to we concentrate on the strategic process and get to make our programs, or rather the execution of our programs, extremely effective. And get to once we succeed in doing that, that we have fulfilled our promise get to because get to we have accomplished the mission. And if we have done that in a strategic way, then there is nothing so great about the name because name automatically will be highlighted because of the features that we have proved or the attributes that we have let the audiences perceive that we really have and we carry. Like we are passionate, we are God-fearing and we are this and we are that. Uh, we know very well that uh, it is not just a question of uh, having certain attributes, it also is a question, or rather a bigger question of perceptions of our audiences. If we have certain attributes and audiences think that, that we do not have those, there is something wrong with the communication uh, process or the communication campaign of the organization. Back to the name. There is nothing wrong with having a straightforward and a simple kind of a name uh, if we are in a position to do all that that I have discussed and talked about in strategic terms. But then the other school of thought says that what is wrong with having a name which is expressive or reflective of certain features or of the positioning of the company or the personality of the company, it automatically conjures up the certain images in the, the mind of the audience as to who we are, what we are, and what we do. Um, needless to say that uh, we have a mood board uh, with the help of which we develop our communication uh, campaigns. And if there is any dissonance between that mood board and what audiences could have in their mind as uh, images in relation to our attributes and all the adjectives that we think uh, we should uh, give to the features that we have, uh, then it is a question of putting together a very uh, get a harmonious kind of uh, get a communication campaign get a which uh, relays and uh, uh, the portrays uh, get the images get the which get the we think are the right ones and get the which really home in to the mind of different audiences. And of course, get the we talk with different audiences in so many different ways. Uh, depending upon our communication objectives, but back to the name. Um, one option that there is nothing wrong with a simple, straightforward name. And the other option that okay, we should have a name okay, which is very powerful and okay, which could be inspiring, okay, which could be change oriented. For example, okay, if we are running a program um, against okay, the smoking, okay, we should have a name okay, which. Uh, may reflect our uh, mission and the mission is to bring about a change in the negative behavior of smokers because this is what we think that their behavior is negative and it has to be transformed into a positive one and therefore a change has to be brought about and we choose a name which is change oriented and by the same token we can have a name which is inspiring if we are uh, uh, carrying out a program in the, the human services, because we can have an inspiring name. Here, because you can go for the argument that uh, we do have organizations uh, operating uh, within this particular area of human services in Pakistan, which really have uh, very simple names and uh, straightforward names, like Edi. You know, the name is not expressive of uh, anything that they do, but the name has become synonymous with extremely I got a passionate uh, execution of uh, programs which uh, deal with human services. And uh, the same is the case with a couple of other organizations uh, whose name uh, you really can imagine and think of uh, while I talk uh, about the importance of names. Uh, but just look at uh, the amount of time and money that may have gone uh, into uh, the, the whole uh, thing that has taken the shape of what this organization is or is all about. So why wait uh, until the time uh, we have really proved our features and our attributes uh, with the help of uh, the deeds uh, which we perform day in and day out? We have the luxury 
of going for a name, if we can think of a name which is expressive of the positioning of the organization and it reflects its personality and what is given here is the fact that we in any case are going to follow the strategic process for brand raising. So in other words, we are not talking of these two things as mutually exclusive. So the one does not exclude the other. It is not to say that if we follow the strategic process, we do not really have to go for a name which is reflective of the personality. In other words, which can be inspiring or which can be um, change-oriented. And because if we do that, uh, um, we cannot follow the, the strategic process. It is not that. We can have the two things at the same time. And if we have the two things at the same time, then we can make the name of the organization very powerful because it really expresses what we do and it immediately flashes into the mind of our audiences as to who we are and what we are. Names can become more powerful with the help of taglines, which I'm going to talk about now. Uh, because taglines also can have uh, the same features or uh, the character as I've talked in relation to names. In other words, taglines could also could, could be inspiring and taglines could also could, could be change-oriented. So we have uh, you know, a couple of options here. Could we can go for a straightforward name could, with an inspiring tagline or could, we can go for an inspiring name could, with a straightforward uh, tagline. And we also are going to have the option of going for an inspiring name and also an inspiring tagline. But if we think that amounts to overdoing things, then we may have to revert back to the option, which is the one thing simple, straightforward, and the other thing inspiring. So a tagline really adds the value to the name of the organization. And together, they become two very powerful elements of uh, the identity, the level of brand raising. I would like to say a word of caution here in relation to acronyms and abbreviations. And this is something I pointed out uh, while talking about logos. Acronyms and abbreviations uh, do not really make uh, the good names, especially when you're starting a nonprofit organization or when you are starting a new program because uh, you really cannot have uh, acronyms and abbreviations um, engage our audiences okay, because um, they do not really have the power to uh, home into the minds of uh, audiences uh, for not being expressive enough of um, the positioning as well as the personality of the organization. And therefore, uh, we should uh, start with uh, the straightforward and inspiring names. Uh, there's an argument you see, which goes against uh, acronyms um, in in, in, the, in the same light, I talked in relation to logos that uh, the meanings of uh, acronyms are not really understood by our audiences. And therefore, why could they test their patience to uh, look into the full name and try to understand uh, what the name says and uh, why this uh, acronym has been uh, derived uh, and uh, how it is uh, placed as part of communications here and there. Taglines, which is the other element uh, that already has been talked about in relation to their power as uh, a combination of uh, names and taglines. And uh, therefore, uh, that does not really warrant uh, too much uh, the talk on uh, its uh, the basic uh, character, uh, with the exception of uh, uh, making the statement uh, all over again that uh, the taglines really add a lot of uh, the value to the name. Uh, they make uh, the name really visible to the audiences because uh, the combination of the two becomes very powerful and very expressive. One thing extremely important about taglines is they have to be able to reflect the positioning and the personality of the organization. And be mindful of uh, the one thing that uh, while I talk about different elements at uh, any level of uh, brand raising, these two elements, i.e. positioning and personality, take very significant place. 
for the simple reason that uh, they are the strategic outcome of the whole process, the strategic process of brand raising. Everything that we do gets translated in terms of positioning and then personality. And if we have the right positioning and personality, I keep on repeating this particular factor, that we keep our communications straightforward and consistent, free of any vagueness. We keep them very clear. And that is the objective, or rather one of the objectives of uh, the good communications, that they have to be uh, clear, they have to be uh, understood by our audiences in a way that uh, it really stirs their uh, thinking uh, into feeling something. Just thinking is not good enough until the time audience really starts feeling it. And as a result of that feeling, the audience gets in, into the action mode. So this is the concept of uh, the contemplation stage, uh, graduating into the action stage. So the power of uh, the communications is a function of so many different things of which uh, a, a very clear tagline uh, that reflects uh, the positioning and the personality of, of the organization is highly important. The next uh, element of uh, the messaging platform uh, is uh, the vision and mission statements. Here, I'm not going to talk about what mission is and what vision is all about. But we are very clear about uh, the starting point of uh, any nonprofit organization, which is the vision. And uh, it is a reflection of the, the vision of the founders uh, that uh, we put everything uh, together as uh, part of the process and uh, get to the uh, desired outcome in relation to, uh, again, I would say, positioning and personality. So therefore, the, the mission, along with the vision statement, uh, have to be expressed uh, very clearly and have to take an important place as uh, the part of the overall messaging platform. The reason I uh, talked about uh, the mission uh, preceding uh, the, the vision statement because you will recall I did tell you uh, in one of the components that uh, many organizations uh, like to have uh, their vision and mission uh, the statement as uh, the one statement. Uh, until the time they are uh, the very uh, selective about uh, the being uh, the futuristic uh, in terms that uh, may not relate uh, very well uh, with the mission at hand. They generally like to have uh, one statement uh, which is uh, a common statement of both the vision of the organization as well as the, the mission. As long as uh, they build up the uh, the positioning and the personality get the side of the organization as get the part of uh, the messaging platform uh, get the, everything is fine get the with them uh, get the, but then there is a lot more to the, get the vision and get the mission statements that uh, get the becomes part of the uh, messaging platform and same is the case with uh, the values get the, of the organization and uh, I think that we have learned quite a bit about uh, the values uh, which uh, basically are uh, the ways um, people uh, within the organization could work uh, based on uh, the certain sets of their beliefs. And uh, the, the value statement could basically uh, being a reflection of uh, the vision and then the mission um, again takes uh, an important place uh, in the messaging platform. Okay, wherever okay, we publicize our okay, the communications, okay, we have to see to it that uh, the vision statement and the mission statement along with uh, the values statement do appear. And you might have noticed that okay, while walking into the reception of okay, the good organizations, they have splashed all these okay, the statements okay, at the very entrance 
because uh, they want uh, the people to be exposed to what they uh, have as their mission and uh, what uh, started the organization as uh, the, the vision of the founder and uh, what are the values they like to follow. And I would like to say again that uh, the messaging platform does not end here. There is more to it. And the reason I'm uh, interjecting here uh, by saying that uh, there is more to it is uh, because in many cases, organizations like to uh, confine themselves to these three statements, okay, the meaning the vision statement, the mission statement, and the values statement. Uh, but the fact is that uh, we have to talk about key messages uh, and we have to talk about the boilerplate, the elevator pitch, and then combine everything together as part of the style guide. Going back to the statements and uh, then um, the element of uh, the key messages, uh, what is important is that uh, we have to establish those um, unique, uh, strong ideas and points that really make the positioning of the organization very strong. And again, I'm talking about positioning because uh, the whole exercise is about making our position strong. If our position is strong, then everything falls in place in terms of engaging our audiences. Okay, more on this later. But the point here is that uh, there are so many different uh, unique things that uh, we like to talk about and yet we have to be very precise and concise because our the mission statement and at the same time our positioning statement can have to be rather concise and uh, there is not everything that uh, we can make a part of that. And therefore, we have to talk about all those points which can be uh, talked about in support of the mission or in support of our positioning. We know very well that uh, among so many different uh, strong features, we have to pick one which is simple and unique and which is really going to uh, stir the imagination of our audience and home in there and uh, develop the immediate connection with the audience um, of our program. That is the one that we pick, and that is the one which reflects a point of differentiation. But then, like I said, there are so many other things that we like to talk about. And those are the things that we talk as part of the key messages. Let us go back to the example of uh, the nursing home and uh, take a look at uh, the mission statement. As part of the mission, in very plain, simple words, okay, what you are trying to convey is that uh, the residents okay, will feel the comfort of their home at the nursing home. Or okay, if you happen to be even more confident and uh, okay, want to be a little more pretentious, okay, you may like to talk about uh, okay, a mission okay, which is to make uh, the nursing home uh, okay, even better than their regular okay, homes. Uh, if um, that is the case and okay, you choose to be that much edgy, if you happen to be really at the cutting edge, you may start making those kinds of claims. But the fact is, that is not something which can be explained as the part of the mission statement. The mission statement only is expressive of what you are about and what is it that you do in a different way. But what really are the ways or what really are the factors that makes you that much special that you are differentiated uh, really goes into the key messages. Uh, you may like to talk about the sociological side of the nursing home okay, because you have certain staff members who understand uh, the fundamentals of uh, psychology and also sociology. Uh, at the same time, you may also like to highlight uh, the strength of uh, the, the partnership that you may have gone into as uh, the part of the cost marketing program and uh, they may like to talk about uh, those restaurants, uh, the hotels or uh, clubs uh, or hospitals that uh, have uh, made uh, your nursing home as special as it is. So whatever contributions uh, you think are uh, special uh, from uh, a standpoint uh, which might become very special uh, and attention seeking to our audience 
then uh, you should talk about all those uh, ASCII messages. You do not really have to be very verbose as uh, the part of the narrative because uh, the objective of communication is to be uh, very concise and precise. Um, you also need to keep uh, the one thing in mind that uh, you are talking with different audiences while they are going through uh, your uh, uh, communications. And therefore, again, you do not say that this statement is meant for your donors and that statement is meant for activists and volunteers. And this particular statement is just, you know, internally focused for the people working for the organization. It's not like that. It is a combination of different messages which become interesting for different audiences. They become really interesting, but then at the same time, really meaningful for those targets for whom they are intended. Like I said, um, there's a paragraph which is uh, meant for donors and there is another one which is meant for activists, so on and so forth. What are the key messages uh, one might like to talk about if one is uh, the part of a hospital? Well, okay, you may like to talk about uh, okay, the very highly trained uh, nursing staff and okay, how you train them. Maybe you are getting international support in terms of uh, training that human resource. And in that particular instance, okay, you have to talk about that because uh, that will really home in. And uh, you may also talk about uh, the very high level of um, qualified uh, the doctors that you have as uh, the part of the human resource. Or you may also like to talk about a state of the art equipment. Now, here you see that I'm giving you many examples for the simple reason uh, for your ability to connect at different components. Here you see that you can connect these key messages with your objectives and you can go back to the mission of the organization and you can further go down the ladder and relate those to the positioning for the organization. And when that is the case, you will realize how consistent you are in terms of putting together your messaging platform. The messaging platform has to be a reflection of consistency because the objective is to take vagueness out of the whole communication process. Let me draw an analogy here from the commercial sector. You might have noticed from different communications organizations talking about their strong points on a very wide spectrum, anywhere starting from their engineering excellence to quality assurance and control to having very highly qualified human resources to after sales services. Now, when they talk about so many different features, it really conjures up a very distinct picture in your mind of that uh, the commercial enterprise as to how they operate. And uh, you get convinced uh, most probably uh, by uh, what they uh, tell you. Uh, there is uh, the more to it in terms of uh, developing conviction of uh, the audience, uh, but here uh, I will like to confine myself to the key messages and the uh, positive role they play toward uh, building up convictions of the target audience. If commercial enterprises talk about uh, key messages as part of detailed communications, and of course, not as part of the mission statement or the positioning uh, for the organization or, or the brand, uh, you also, as part of the nonprofit, can talk about certain strong and unique uh, uh, points as key messages. And uh, once they become an integral part of uh, your communications, uh, they in turn become the more effective. So on the nonprofit side, what we people are supposed to be doing is to come up with um, key messages that are weighty enough and strong enough to uh, make our audiences think, feel, and then do something. Doing is all about taking the action. Experts say that uh, the good communications uh, should be able to develop a connection uh, with the target audience and uh, promise the reward that uh, the program or the product offers, inspire certain action on part of the target audience and stick into the memory of the audience. 
So if you take a close look at the four elements of the function that I've talked about, one is the connection, the other one is uh, the reward, the third one is uh, the action, and the fourth one is uh, memory. You develop a connection because uh, your campaign is very effective and consistent, and that connection develops attention on part of the target audience, and they get attracted to the program. So that is the point of entry uh, or the gateway to the remaining um, elements of the overall function. Once you, know, you have established that gateway, then you promise the reward, which basically is an expansion, an extension of the concept of uh, benefit reward. But you have to talk about the reward which the program offers. And of course, you know, if we go back uh, to this particular component, whether we also get to talk about uh, the cost you know, that they may have to uh, pay, but we have to be very subtle about that. It basically is the uh, benefit that we highlight. The highlighting of uh, the benefit will inspire the target audience to take the action. And once the audience has taken the action, the message that we are trying to convey will stick in the memory for a long time to come. And given the fact that uh, communications are a repetitive process and uh, we have so many different ways and means to make ourselves uh, visible and there are so many uh, the points of uh, interaction and exposure uh, the between our organization or for that matter between our communications and uh, all those uh, uh, the audiences that uh, we are trying to reach and be exposed to that uh, we really can do this job uh, on a regular basis and we do do it uh, because uh, the communications uh, take place on a daily basis. Uh, even when you are writing a letter, it is part of the communications uh, that uh, form the overall communication process because they do see the logo, they read the uh, tagline, and uh, if there are uh, the certain pictorials and images as part of the communication, it will uh, the flash the picture to which they are used to. And the letter that you have written is uh, an addition to the, what is a standard communication, meaning your advertising and whatever you have to see as part of standardized uh, the print uh, the media or as uh, the part of your web. Back to the four elements of the overall function, the meaning connectivity and uh, the action and uh, reward and uh, uh, the memory. Experts have coined an acronym which is known as CRAM, which is C-R-A-M. And this is what they call cramming the message into the mind of the audience. And uh, the cramming uh, when you look at uh, these alphabets uh, in the order of C, R, A, M, you may not uh, find it exactly in the order uh, things uh, the work starting from the entry point of connection. But uh, for us to uh, remember it, I think the acronym is strong enough. And uh, here I would like to reiterate uh, once again that uh, we have to revisit the concept of uh, the benefit reward. And if we are uh, really uh, offering a good reward around which uh, the program of any nonprofit uh, revolves, uh, we uh, can cram the message uh, successfully. Um, for the message to be successful, there are uh, a few more uh, considerations as part of uh, a good communication package. Uh, the one is that um, I already have talked about, meaning the diversity of the key messages in terms of our effort to approach different audiences. Because we are trying to reach different audiences as activists, as volunteers, as community leaders, as donors. So we have to have different messages that have relevance to those audiences. And all those messages will cram uh, better and more effectively if uh, we uh, give due consideration to the, what is it 
that uh, is to be talked about while we try to reach donors, for example. And this is where we can go back to the example of segmentation. Uh, we look into the various motivations and uh, finding you know, which uh, uh, level of motivation uh, is most appropriate with the objective of communication that we are trying to achieve. If we can highlight that and uh, make our uh, communication the more uh, powerful and uh, the consistent. We are uh, carrying out a campaign against smoking and we are communicating continually with different audiences. Just look at the differences when it comes to what we are trying to achieve through our communications. For the smoker, we are telling him, you will rid yourself of the vice and he understands that. And if he really quits smoking, it is a very good feeling for the activist because you know he has a sense of fulfillment. He really worked really hard and uh, brought the smokers around the point that uh, this habit is injurious. So the communication essence here is different for the audience, which consists of activists. Just look at uh, the donors. The donors really have a feeling of satisfaction and happiness that they have given something. And the fact is that uh, the feeling of uh, the giving is uh, highly significant in relation to the charities, uh, philanthropy, and uh, the donations uh, for nonprofits. Scientific research has proved a very interesting point that I must share with you. After taking brain scans of a group of um, people, scientists have established that when you give, the state of happiness that emerges in your mind leads to certain warm glows, just like you see a room getting lit up when you put on the bulb. So it is the warm glow that we as marketing people should be after. That we should be able to put together our messages. We are still talking about key messages. Don't lose sight of that fact. We have to be able to put together our key messages in a way that they lead to creating those warm glows in the brains of our audience. And if we are successful in doing so, all is well with our communications. Yet another uh, important uh, the factor that uh, we must consider, and uh, the fact of the matter is, as part of communications for nonprofits, this uh, happens to be um, even more important than um, the ones that uh, I've talked about. Now, this is not to say that uh, the one takes precedence over the other. They all, um, as a combination of uh, the messages, create strength. Uh, but the reason I say that this is uh, more important than others is because this is very effective if uh, we can use this particular factor uh, very smartly. And that is the factor of storytelling. It is uh, very simple, straightforward. Uh, but the fact is that when we start telling stories to our audiences, we uh, develop a sense of a shared experience. That we are sharing that particular experience with the audience that is the, at the receiving end. That we are sharing something that already has happened. And that we are telling them this is the way the donors came forward toward the cause. And this is how activists are to work for the cause day in and day out. And this is how the internal staff committed itself toward executing the program. And once you have talked about those messages by substantiation of certain real life stories, that you are creating a platform which is emotional, which carries a personal touch. And whenever audiences can develop a personal relationship with a set of communications, they are apt to um, adopt what is said in those communications.
And there is a good reason for that. Uh, we as humans are uh, generally and basically conformists. We like to see what people are doing. We like to follow what we see others as thinking. So in other words, we take a lot of cues in terms of what others, how to think and what to do. By telling stories, we develop such cues. And the people have a tendency to fall in line in doing something which others are doing or which others have done. Taking cue from others in doing uh, what they are doing uh, is what social psychologists call the power of social proof. I think it's a beautiful terminology and uh, it tells us uh, how powerful it is uh, if uh, we can tell people, uh, listen, this is the way uh, the other people behave and this is the way uh, the people hold certain values very close to their heart and this is the way they have um, carried out uh, things in favor of the cause that we are communicating to you and why don't you listen to them? I mean, that's the message and people will listen. That's the power of the social proof. Here the question is, how do we extract good stories as uh, the part of our communication process? Well, stories cannot be fabricated. They have to be real-time experiences and uh, real-life happenings. Therefore, we have to resort to what experts call the two-way communication process. And there are two different forms of two-way communications. The one is the traditional way, our interactions, where our audiences, whether we like it or not, whether we plan it or not, which is more appropriate. We do get into contact with our audiences at different points of life. We get into touch with them in meetings. We get into contact with them in seminars at other places like galas and uh, you know musical evenings uh, the different promotional uh, the programs we can talk about things with which they have experienced and they think you know are important for them and therefore can be and should be shared with us we can pinpoint stories by getting into interaction with our audiences wherever um, opportunity provides us with the platform. This is the um, essence of uh, the, the two-way uh, communication um, in real-life instances. The other option is uh, through the web. You know, let's talk about the blogosphere. It's a two-way traffic, you know, that we are talking with our audience, they are talking with us, they are talking about positive things, they are talking about negative things. Here, let's concentrate on the positive advocacy and they definitely they will share some very good experiences uh, which they have had with the organization. Um, while uh, trying to unearth what really motivates uh, different uh, the donors, we did unravel a very convincing um, basis of for the motivation. It goes without saying that motivations are going to have to spring uh, from certain real life good things. And uh, stories could be ex extracted from good experiences with which um, audiences uh, that are feeling motivated have experienced. And uh, you can build on uh, those uh, the motivations by getting back to those audiences and uh, uh, pick the right uh, stuff for your uh, the messages as part of the overall log uh, of the communications. Whether through the web or through uh, real life uh, encounters, the point is you have to be able to extract all those experiences of your audiences that have been very positive and rewarding to them. Because when you talk about those experiences, you are in a position to cram the message. Thanks.